Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to provide you with an update as to what's happening in China. Data on the profitability of Chinese businesses for the first four months of 2023 has now been released, and that data shows that profits are down by more than 20%, which is cause for concern in itself. However, in some sectors, such as the steel industry, profits are down by more than 99%. And for a country whose economy is intrinsically linked to the property sector, this is an extremely worrying trend. So in today's episode, we'll have a look at the details of the profit figures that have been released. We'll talk about what's happening in the steel industry. We'll have a look at what's going on with regards to employment levels in China and the worrying trend around youth unemployment. We'll look at the data for industrial production, what's happening with imports and exports, what's going on with regards to inflation, because China has the opposite problem to the rest of the world. They're suffering from deflation. We'll touch on what's happening in the real estate sector. And then finally today, I'll provide my summary as to what I think is likely to happen for the Chinese economy over the course of the next three to six months and what the implications of this are for the global economy. Profits at Chinese industrial firms slumped in the first four months of 2023 as companies continued to struggle with margin pressures and soft demand amid a faltering economic recovery. Profits for the period from January to April fell 20.6% compared with 2022, and in April alone, industrial firms posted an 18.2% drop in profit year on year. Lenovo, the world's largest PC maker, said this week that quarterly revenue and profits tanked in the period between January and March, and the company has cut around 9% of its workforce to reduce costs as global demand for personal computers continues to slump. Producers of steel and other industrial metals are also hurting. Prices for steel reinforcing bars used in construction hit the lowest level in three years this week, and only a third of China's steel mills are currently operating at a profit. Foreign firms saw their profits slide 16.2% in the first four months of the year, while private sector firms recorded a 22.5% plunge. Profits are reported as being lower in 27 of the 41 major industrial sectors in China, with ferrous metal smelting and rolling processing industry reporting the biggest slump at 99.4%. Chinese companies are struggling with both weak demand at home and softening demand in the country's major export markets. And Bruce Pang, chief economist at Jones Lang LaSalle, was quoted as saying, Overall, today's data shows that industrial enterprises, especially private and equity-owned enterprises, continue to be affected by a combination of unfavourable factors such as the base effect, short-term pressure on the economic recovery, and the downward trend on producer prices. This graphic, produced by Visual Capitalist, shows the world's largest producers of steel. And you can see that in 2022, China produced around 54% of the total global supply. The second largest supplier, with around 7%, was India, followed by Japan, the United States, Russia, South Korea, Germany, Turkey, Brazil, Iran, Italy, Taiwan, Vietnam, Mexico and Indonesia. And in terms of demonstrating the rapid growth that has been seen in the steel industry in China over the last 50 years, this graphic shows the breakdown of global supply in 1967, 1996 and 2006. And you can see that back in 1967, the world's largest suppliers were the USA, the Soviet Union and Japan. And China only represented around 3% of total supplies. By 1996, China had grown to become the world's largest supplier. However, by that stage, its market share was still only 14%, which was only slightly larger than the USA, Russia and Japan. However, by 2006, China's market share had grown to 34%, which was more than the combined market share for the USA, Russia and Japan. And if we compare the situation today, China has a market share of 54%, Japan has a market share of 4.8%, the USA 4.3% and Russia 3.8%. So the steel industry has grown rapidly in China and represents an important part of the Chinese economy, particularly because the sectors that have the biggest demand for steel in China are real estate and infrastructure. So what's happening with regards to the demand and price of steel has a really big bearing on what's happening to the Chinese economy. Steel prices in China have now hit the lowest level for three years. The spot price of HRB 420mm steel rebar has fallen to 3,510 yuan, which is around 508 US dollars, which is the lowest level seen since April 2020, which was the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Disappointing demand in what is normally the peak construction season during March and April kicked off the decline, and in China currently infrastructure stimulus has slowed and the property market is showing little growth. This graphic shows the breakdown in the demand for steel over the last six years. The largest single sector that uses steel is property, and between 2018 and 2021, this sector accounted for around 40% of all demand. However, due to the global slowdown in the property market, and particularly within China, demand from the real estate sector in 2023 is down to 33%. Infrastructure is the next largest sector, and between 2018 and 2020, represented around 26% of demand. However, that has risen to 31% in the current market, predominantly because we're seeing a reduction in the total market, and as demand from the infrastructure sector has remained relatively stable. In percentage terms, it's increased in terms of its relative importance. The third largest sector in terms of demand is machinery. However, the percentage importance has dropped from 20% in 2018 to 18% today. And the situation is similar for the fourth largest sector, which is demand from the automobile industry, which has fallen from 9% in 2018 to 7% today. China steel demand declined by 3.4% in April, compared with an increase of 8.7% in March. And the indicative figures for May show a fall of 2.5%. Investment in the property sector, the largest user of steel, declined by 6.2% year-on-year in the first four months of the year, which represented a further decline from the 5.8% fall seen in the first quarter. New construction starts by floor area contracted by 21% over the first four months of the year, which was a further deterioration on the 19% fall seen in the first three months. Sluggish demand for steel is increasing pressure on steel mills ahead of the summer months of June to August when construction in China typically slows as high temperatures and heavy rain in the south hinder outdoor activity. Only a third of the country's mills are currently operating at a profit according to MySteel and shares in global miners plunged this week as iron ore prices fell on China's weak demand. Steel prices are not expected to improve until September when the weather conditions are more favourable for construction and a raft of economic stimulus measures filter through to the property market. This chart shows the movement in China's unemployment rate over the last 12 months. In May 2022, China's unemployment rate was running at 5.9%. By August 22, the rate was down to 5.3%. It rose back up to 5.7% in November 22. However, over the last six months, the rate has come down to the current level of 5.2%. So when you look at this graph at face value, you would think that things are going quite well because the general trend is downwards. But let's have a look how these figures compare to the USA. This figure shows the unemployment rate in the USA over the last 12 months, and you can see that the current level of unemployment is 3.4%, which is considerably lower than the 5.2% unemployment in China. And that's concerning for a couple of reasons. Firstly, China is a growth economy, so it's seeing year-on-year -year expansion in terms of its output and its GDP. So that means that the unemployment rates in China should be lower than a country like the USA, which is far more developed and is growing at a slower rate. But there are also some other areas of concern. China has a population of 1.4 billion, compared with the US population of around 335 million. So in real terms, an unemployment rate of 5% represents tens of millions of people. But the biggest single cause for concern in China is what's happening with youth unemployment. This chart shows the unemployment rate for Chinese people aged between 16 and 24, dating back to 2018. And this shows that five years ago, youth unemployment in China was running at around 12%, which in itself is a high and concerning rate. However, today, youth unemployment is running at more than 20%. So what that means is that one in five people coming out of the Chinese education system, either coming out of schools or universities, are failing to find a job. And that is a major problem because if you don't get your foot onto the employment ladder at an early stage, it becomes very difficult to find any sort of employment. So you could become long-term unemployed. And this chart shows the total number of employed people in China dating back to 2013. And this shows that there has been a decline in the number of people working in China in every single year since 2015. And the rate of decline is now accelerating and hit its fastest level in 2022. And this trend is very concerning because when you look at the population pyramid for China, China has got a reducing birth rate. In 2023, China recorded its first fall in population numbers for over 50 years. 
So China now has an aging population. And this is going to be a major problem because it's still a growth economy. It's still expanding, but it doesn't have an increasing number of people. So what it needs to do is harness all of the young people, bring them into employment to make sure that they've got enough capacity to be able to keep producing at the same levels. But actually what we're seeing right now is that youth unemployment is rising. So the young people aren't being welcomed into the working community and the total number of workers is falling. And this is going to represent a major problem for China over the course of the next 20 years. This chart shows the year-on-year -year percentage movement in industrial production in China. China is the biggest supplier of manufactured goods in the world and as a result this metric gives us a very good steer as to what's happening in the Chinese economy. Now, as you can see from this chart, over the course of the last 12 months, China has achieved positive growth in industrial production in every single month. And in April 2023, industrial production increased by 5.6%, which was a positive movement against the 3.9% seen in March and the 2.4% seen in February. And over the course of the last 12 months, 5.6% is actually the second highest growth rate. So at face value, you may be thinking that these figures show that China is doing really well. However, unfortunately, in order to achieve the targeted level of growth for China, it needs to be hitting far better figures than this. And the forecast level of growth for April 23 was actually 10.9%. So 5.6% represents a shortfall of 5.3%. This chart shows the movement in the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index over the course of the last 12 months. Now, if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you'll know that we've looked at the Purchasing Managers Index a number of times. And this is a globally recognized index that's put together using data provided by purchasing managers from key industries all across the world. And it shows whether those manufacturing businesses are expanding or contracting. Now, the scale on the right hand side of this chart is an index and it goes from 48 to 52. And the key figure when looking at this index is 50. A score above 50 indicates that the manufacturing business is expanding, whereas a score below 50 indicates that it's contracting. And as you can see in April 23, the index for China was 49.5%, which is obviously below 50% and therefore indicates that Chinese manufacturing is contracting. And if we look at the trend as to what's been happening in 2023, you can see that in January, the index was below 50. However, in February, it surged to more than 51.5%, which indicated that there was strong growth in the Chinese manufacturing sector. But unfortunately, that growth was short-lived and we saw the index fall back to 50% in March and has now fallen further again. And if we look back to the start of this year, you can see that what's happening right now is an exact repeat of the pattern that we saw in May, June, July, August, and September. And as you can see in September, the index fell to just above 48%. So the concern now is that the figures for May may be considerably worse. This chart shows the year-on-year -year percentage movement in imports and exports for China dating back to April 2021. The dark blue line in this chart plots what's been happening with imports and the light blue line exports. And the scale on the left hand side of this chart goes from minus 20% to plus 40%. Imports fell by 7.9% year on year, which extended the 1.4% decline seen in March. And these figures are a direct result of weak domestic demand. And if we take a step back and look at the trend over the last two years, you can see that it's highly negative. In April 2021, as China was coming out of the first wave of lockdowns, imports were increasing by more than 40%. Between April 21 and April 22, China saw a steady reduction in that growth in imports. And over the course of the last 12 months, the level of imports has actually fallen. It's moved into negative territory on this chart. And that fall in imports is highly concerning for two reasons. Firstly, it reflects reduced consumer demand within China. They're buying less things in. But more importantly, it shows a slowdown in Chinese manufacturing. Because China is importing large amounts of raw materials, which it uses for its manufacturing processes. So the fact that there's been a reduction in those purchases means that it will be producing less. And therefore, that will have a direct negative impact on the Chinese economy because they will be producing less, selling less, and their GDP will be impacted. Impacted. If we now look at the situation for exports, you can see that exports grew by 8.5% in April. However, that level of growth represented a sharp fall against the 14.8% increase seen in March. And the major concerns here are that firstly, when you compare what's happening in April this year to April last year, 
April 2022 was a particularly weak period. A lot of lockdowns had been introduced in China and that had a negative impact on the level of exports at that time. So on a year-on-year -year basis, the April 23 figures are being compared with a comparatively low figure. So 8.5% growth in that context doesn't represent stellar growth. And when you combine that analysis with what's happening with imports and also all the manufacturing data that we're going to come onto in a moment, it's raising major concerns for the Chinese economy. And once again, if we take a step back and look at what's been happening over the course of the last two years, you can see that in April 21, export growth was around 30% positive. However, in the 12 months to April 22, there was a consistent decline in the level of growth. There was actually a bounce back in export growth between April and July 22. However, since August, we've seen a decline in the level of growth. And between October 22 and February 23, there was actually a decline in the level of exports. We saw a bounce back in quarter one of 23. However, that bounce back now looks like an anomaly. This chart shows the movement in the consumer price index and the producer price index in China dating back to January 2021. The scale on the left hand side of this chart ranges from minus 5% at the bottom to plus 10% at the top and the dotted red line you can see across the middle of this chart represents the government's target inflation rate of 2.5%. The blue line at the top of this chart represents the producer price index, which is also known as the factory gate price. And this is plotting the price of products that companies in China are manufacturing. So it's measuring whether or not the prices are going up or going down. And the red line on this chart represents the consumer price index, which is basically the rate of inflation. So this is the basket of goods that's measured on a monthly basis, comparing the price of those goods to see whether or not prices are going up or going down. So we start off by looking at consumer price index or the inflation rate first. You can see that back in January 21, the rate of inflation was actually below zero. So China was experiencing deflation. Prices were actually going down. And over the course of the last two years, the rate of inflation hasn't actually ever hit the target rate of 2.5%. So that means that China has seen very little in the way of inflation. On average, prices have been rising by 1% or 2% which is obviously in direct contrast to what's been happening in the rest of the world. Following the ending of COVID-19 restrictions at the end of 2020 in most countries, we saw a surge in consumer demand, which drove up prices. And in many economies, we saw inflation rising above 10%. And for the majority of governments and central banks, bringing down the rate of inflation has been their number one objective. And as a result of that, we have seen a rapid rise in interest rates. But none of that has affected China. Because of the prolonged period of COVID-19 restrictions, China didn't have this huge bounce back and surge in demand that we saw in a lot of other economies. And if we look at what's been happening over the course of the last six months, you can see that inflation has fallen from around 2% to the current annual rate of 0.1%. So basically, there's been no movement in prices in China over the course of the last 12 months. Now, in view of all of the Ferrari and conversations that people have been having about rising inflation over the course of the last two years, you may be thinking that 0% inflation sounds pretty good, that if prices are the same as they were this time last year, that's quite a good thing from a consumer point of view. But the problem that China has is that its whole economy is based on manufacturing. So it needs all of its industry to be making more profit in order for the economy to grow. And for the vast majority of businesses, they want to see year on year increases in their prices because generally speaking, their costs are going up. And so you need to pass on your increased costs into increased prices. So this is why a lot of governments have a target rate of inflation of around 2%. They want to see some healthy growth in prices. They they don't want prices to remain flat and stagnant because it will mean that a lot of companies whose costs are rising will be making less profit if they can't sell their products at a higher price. And that is exactly what's happening in China right now. Prices have flatlined and therefore companies are making less profit. There is real pressure on their margins. If we now look at what's happened to the producer price index, during 2021, there was a rapid increase in producer prices, moving from around 0% at the start of the year to almost 15% by the end of the year. 
However, during 2022, we saw a complete reversal of that trend. And over the course of that year, prices moved from a positive increase of 15% to a fall of around 1%. And this is really bad news for the Chinese economy. Because the reason that factory gate prices were coming down wasn't because costs were coming down. In fact, in 2022, the price of raw materials rose dramatically in the international markets. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we saw a huge spike in the price of oil and gas and coal and other commodities. So prices actually increased, but China was reducing its factory gate prices in order to remain competitive and try to achieve a higher level of sales. And if we look at the situation for April, you can see that year on year factory gate prices have fallen by 3.6%. So the selling price for goods that China is manufacturing is now 3.6% lower than it was this time last year. However, the costs have gone up and that means that those companies are making less profit. And when you apply that across the whole economy, that is going to be really bad news for China. Investment in the property sector, a key pillar of the Chinese economy, tumbled 16.2% year on year in April after a 7.2% drop in March as investors remain cautious on the property sector. And this chart shows the year on year movement in newly built house prices in China over the last five years. And the reason that this metric is important is that the Chinese property market is dominated by newly built properties. The vast majority of all property purchases are new build, the majority of which are purchased off plan. So people are buying them before they're actually constructed. And what this chart shows is that property prices are still falling month on month. And this is a reflection of the fact that Chinese consumers have lost confidence in the property sector. If we look back at the situation over the last five years, you can see that in 2018, property prices were increasing by around 5%. However, between 2018 and the first half of 2019, the rate of increase actually got above 10%. However, at that point, the Chinese authorities brought in what was known as the three red lines. And these were regulations that were introduced to stop the Chinese property developers becoming over leveraged, taking on too much debt. But unfortunately for a lot of those companies, they'd already gone past the point of no return. With the most famous example being Evergrande that had built up over $300 billion of debt, which is a mind bending amount of debt. And this chart shows a graphical representation of the impact of that policy on the Chinese property sector. Because they could no longer access large amounts of debt, the Chinese property developers actually had to slow down their rate of build. And this meant that a lot of properties were not finished that people had already paid for. And that started to have a direct impact on the consumer confidence in property prices. And over the course of the last four years, we have seen the rate of growth in property prices coming down. And during the second half of 2022, we actually started to see prices falling. And because around 25% of the Chinese economy is dependent upon the property sector, that's had a negative impact on the Chinese economy itself. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video to share with you the latest data coming out of China. And what we've seen from today's figures is that the slowdown in China that we've been seeing over the course of the last month or so is now starting to translate into profits. Profits in the first four months of 2023 are down by more than 20% compared with this time last year. So that's obviously cause for concern in itself. However, when you dig into the details of the breakdown of those profits, the steel sector within China is down by more than 99%. And that is a major concern because the Chinese economy is intrinsically linked to real estate, infrastructure and the steel industry. That's been the heartbeat of Chinese growth over the course of the last 20 years. If you follow the channel, you'll be fully aware that there's been a residential boom in China since the turn of the century. Huge property development companies such as Evergrande have been building whole cities of apartments and the people of China were desperate to put their money into property. And over the last 20 years, this became a virtuous circle where properties were sold off plan and the property developers literally could not build the apartments quick enough. However, the Chinese government became concerned about the levels of debt that these property companies were racking up. Evergrande itself had more than $300 billion worth of debt. And as a result, the Chinese authorities brought in new regulations called the Three Red Lines, which restricted the amount of debt that these companies had access to. And that really put the brakes onto the property sector. And what we're now seeing in the latest results is the impact of that.
the price of properties is now falling and demand in real estate from both consumers and investors is also down. And as a result of that, demand for steel is falling and the price of steel is falling and that's having a major impact on the Chinese steel industry. And then when you layer on top of that what's going on with regards to the global economy, where we've still got persistently higher levels of inflation than central banks want, that's meant that there's been a slowdown in the global economy, a reduction in demand. And so overseas orders from Chinese steel is also falling. And what we've seen from the data in today's video is that that slowdown in demand is now permeating through lots of different areas of the Chinese economy. So 2023 looks like it's going to be a difficult year for China. And the expectation now is that the growth that China will see will be lower than originally expected. And one of the major problems that the Chinese economy is facing, unlike most of the rest of the world, is that it's actually experiencing deflation. It's seeing prices going down. And deflation is equally as bad as inflation. Because if prices are falling or remaining static, that means that all of the companies within your country are unable to raise their prices. So if they have an increase in cost, they have to absorb that cost. And that's exactly what we've seen in today's figures. The fall in profitability from all of these Chinese companies is as a result of the fact that their costs have gone up, but they haven't been able to pass those cost increases onto their customers. They've had to absorb them and therefore they've made less profit. And for a country such as China, which is a net exporter, it's manufacturing things and then exporting them all around the world. That's a major problem because when your costs are rising and you can't pass on price increases, that means that intrinsically you're making less profit. And at some point you could become insolvent. So all of this is obviously bad news for China. But what's the potential impact on the global economy? Well, China is the second largest economy in the world. It's a behemoth. It is absolutely massive. China's GDP represents around 18% of global GDP. So when China starts to suffer problems, that will have a direct knock-on impact to the rest of the world. Because although China is a net exporter, it's also importing large quantities of goods. So when the Chinese economy starts to slow down, that means that it will buy less from all of those other countries that it's purchasing from. And so those countries will see a reduction in their revenue, and that will have a direct impact onto their GDP and growth. So the bottom line here is that any contraction in the Chinese economy will have a direct impact onto the global economy. So it will be bad news for everybody. So I'll keep you posted on any further news and developments coming out of China. If you've liked what I've said today, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.